this is John Golan, and I'm going to be reviewing some alternative fighter performance metrics with an emphasis on those which emerged in the latter 1980s and beyond, some of the more modern measures. And this is effectively a follow-on to the previous summary that I presented on aircraft performance. So to provide a little bit of a recap, in the pre-1960s era, the classical measures of aircraft performance, including fighter performance that were in vogue, were single design point type metrics. Things like maximum speed, time to altitude, acceleration times. In the 1960s, many of these were largely superseded as the primary figures of merit by energy maneuverability theory, or EM diagrams. These were plots depicting isocontours of constant specific excess power across an entire flight envelope. So they provided a little bit more of a holistic view of how the aircraft would perform. Then in the latter 1980s, we began to see a new series of metrics come into vogue. And these were able to leverage the increased computational capabilities of that era. And they rely on a simulation of individual maneuvers to arrive at a metric. So most of the focus uh, for this particular summary will be on the latter set of metrics. So the alternative modern agility metrics include things like combat cycle time, dynamic speed turn plots, relative energy states, and so forth. These are metrics that, again, rely on a direct simulation of a particular maneuver as a point of comparison. So, for example, combat cycle time, first proposed back in 1988, and it's really the time that it takes for an airplane to change heading by a specified amount and then recover energy lost during the turn. So it can be broken down into the time segments to roll and load up to maximum load factor, reach the corner speed, reach the new angle of heading, and then unload back to 1G conditions and accelerate back to the original energy level. Now the first individuals to utilize something like a combat cycle time uh, just basically flew the limits of the dog plot. So they, they basically assumed that the airplane wanted to go to its max load factor immediately and then reach the true corner speed of the airplane, which again is the the condition where you get the max instantaneous turn rate, make the turn, and then unload back to 1G conditions and accelerate back up. The issue here, of course, uh, is that that is not necessarily the optimum conditions under which to make the turn if your objective is to recover energy at the end. So if you really want to know what an optimum is, you have to do something called an optimized trajectory analysis, which is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, and again, when you do this, what you'll find is that you can reduce the total combat cycle time by 20% or more. To perform an optimization like this, of course, you really need a detailed model for the aircraft performing the maneuver. You need to understand what the pitch and yaw and roll rates of this aircraft are. You need to be able to bookkeep energy bleed rates due to both g-loading and the angle of attack. It's a much more computationally intensive approach than something like an EM diagram or a single point performance measure. So to gain a sense of what a combat cycle time or similar metric might bring to the table, we can look at an example from a study published back in 1995 that compared the performance of the F-18, the X-29, and the X-31 based upon open literature data. And in this particular instance, they simplified the analysis so that each aircraft was restricted to a 7G max low limit, to kind of level up the playing field, if you will. And they assumed that each aircraft began a turning maneuver at Mach 0.8 and 15,000 foot altitude. And the altitude of each aircraft was restricted to within plus or minus 2,500 feet from the starting altitude. In this particular study, they used an optimum trajectory analysis to minimize the turn rate. And they calculated the time to perform a 180 degree turn and then recover lost energy. And the results of the study were not immediately obvious if you would have looked at any traditional performance measure. So the aircraft with the lowest combat cycle time, the fastest turn and, and recovery, 
turned out to be the F-18, which was the aircraft with the highest max instantaneous turn rate. However, the next lowest combat cycle time went to the X-31, which had the slowest maximum instantaneous turn rate. So because the combat cycle time is a combined measure, combining both turn rates and the ability to recover energy, it be lends some new insight that might not necessarily be obvious by looking at a single perf historical performance measure or another. So despite this obvious utility, we will continue to see a wide variety of performance measures still in use in the decades to come. And part of that is because of computational cost. To perform something like a combat cycle time or a dynamic speed turn plot, you need a lot of information that is not available early in a design cycle. And unless you are privy to flight test data or someone else has published it for you, you won't be privy to it later in development cycle either. So for a variety of reasons, we will continue to see some of the less expensive single point design uh, maneuvers uh, being cited, things like maximum speed or max instantaneous turn rate. And we will continue to see EM diagrams in use because they provide insight across the flight envelope that you don't get from something like combat cycle time. And we will continue to see at the higher end the explicit air combat simulations uh, that some of us have recognized in the past from publications by uh, Wolfgang Herbst among others even going back to the 1970s. So there is a place for each of these measures, and they will all continue to be used. So again, comparing between the, some of the available performance metrics, we can see that the modern agility metrics provides insight into combined effects of components that go into a maneuver. Things like turn rate and acceleration, both of which are important. However, they are still restricted to evaluations against a particular maneuver. In the case of combat cycle time, it's typically a 180 degree turn. So there's an underlying assumption that the pilot of each aircraft would want to perform that equivalent turn or maneuver. And there are restrictions, there are assumptions that go into that calculation, that analytical model, as to the speed and altitude range throughout the maneuver. So in the example given previously, there were some altitude restrictions in there, which an actual pilot wouldn't necessarily have to be limited to. In contrast, something like an EM diagram plots excess energy for each aircraft without making any assumption about how that excess energy might be utilized by an individual pilot, which is part of what makes it so simple, elegant, and attractive because it doesn't assume that both pilots flying different aircraft would necessarily want to fly the same maneuver in exactly the same way. So, on top of which, of course, the modern agility metrics are also more expensive. Um, and therefore, these metrics will continue, as I said, to complement, not replace, traditional measures of aircraft performance. So in summation, the underlying utility of each performance metric is relative to its cost, is a subjective measure. How much are you willing to spend to get the additional insight? How much time are you willing to wait to get the additional insight? And is it worth it to you? Again, that's very subjective and depends upon what you wanted out of that particular metric or comparison. Single design point metrics are still very easy to calculate and provide an inexpensive first insight. EM diagrams still provide a comprehensive view of performance across the entire flight envelope without presupposing how each aircraft will be flown by a particular pilot. The more modern agility metrics, while they do offer additional insight, also require significant computational investment. And finally, full-featured pilot simulations that put an experienced pilot into the cockpit still remain the gold standard. They are as close as you will get to comparing two aircraft for a particular role other than actually building and flying the aircraft. So if you're going to weigh 
new technologies, understand what the advantages or disadvantages of particular design features are, this is the gold standard. Takes all of the guesswork out of it. Very hard to argue with kill to loss ratios. So that summarizes my survey of some of the modern uh, performance metrics that are available and have come to fruition in the last couple of decades. Thank you all very much.